Okay, so at the last several minutes that I needed to actually complete uh, the connections I was going to make um, regarding the transformers as well as the GANs. So I'm just going to do that right now. Um, so uh, this was obviously from 1021 class and I'm just going to go through the last few slides again before you know going somewhat slower. Um, so we mentioned that we talked about the data augmentation and why data augmentation essentially means that you have some idea about the domain and how classes are connected to the input data. For example, changing the orientation of the cat doesn't, that still keeps it as a cat, for example, that is domain knowledge. Um, so, and also, I think I also mentioned in the context, in that context, that uh, Lin Guan uh, has a, a new rips, um, um, you know, spotlight paper um, on basically doing this sort of human guided reinforcement learning when humans are giving advice. Um, but you're doing context aware data augmentation, where essentially the human annotates uh, some region annotates some region um, of the picture of the picture that both of them are looking at picture um, and say, this is the reason um, the decision should be, the action should be here. Okay. And so in essence, the human is trying to correct the the reinforcement learning program, reinforcement learner, and there's this once in a while they're giving this um, changing the decision and saying this particular part of the image means this should be the action A. So, for example, they might annotate a stop sign um, and then say because there's a stop sign, the action should be break, for example. And now, the question then is every time they do this, it takes time for the humans to do this. Um, can you take that same one example and make it into multiple examples? And the idea that um, Lin and Mudit um, use um, is essentially to um, is, is, is essentially to uh, keep the annotated region constant uh, and change the rest of the image by perturbing the pixel values using Gaussian blur or some various other things. So. The expectation is that whatever happens to the rest of the image, essentially this annotated region winds up being um, the reason why the decision would be correct. And so in some sense, you can convert one data uh, point, one feedback from the uh, human into multiple additional augmented feedbacks. And this is then, you know, kind of increases the effectiveness of the human guidance. So that was sort of being used for the data augmentation. Um, we also talked about transfer learning and we talked about pre-trained trunks in the class already. Uh, so I'm just going to remind you of that. Go back to the class. I'm going to add this as the extension video for today's class. Okay. Um, and then I went through this quickly, but I want to walk you through this, that generative versus discriminative learning essentially is in the end, you're trying to kind of compute the joint distribution of the data. So the data may well be the picture of the cat as well as the label saying it is cat. So the label saying it is cat is Y, the picture of the cat is X. So maybe it will be X12, X4096, which is the number of uh, pixels in the, uh, the input, okay? Um, so then the question is, what are we trying to learn? The most information you can learn about this data and its label is the joint distribution P, Y, P, X, Y. Um, but what you can do is that, um, the you can actually get by with just discriminative learning by saying I will only learn p y given x um, essentially because all I need to know is if I know the x values the pixels what would its label be if you only learn I'm sorry if you only learn p y given x you will be able to um, say it is a cat when shown the picture of a cat. 
But if I say the word cat, you won't be able to generate the picture of the cat. Do you understand what I'm saying? So the learner can take as input cat picture and output, this is a cat. So basically they can take some pictures and say, these are cats, these are dogs, but they don't have a, a theory of cats in the sense, if I say cat, they won't be able to visualize a cat in their head because they don't know the P of X. Okay. Um, on the other hand, if you learn the, the joint distribution, in essence, if I say, you know, cat, you will be able to remember the cat. If I show the cat picture, you will be able to remember the word cat. And if I show you piece of the cat picture, you will be able to remember the rest of the cat picture in your mind, complete the rest of the cat picture, as well as sort of complete the label for it. This basically generative learning is sort of learning the distribution of the entire data itself. And it's a more powerful learning, but it takes typically, it's harder to do generative learning. Oftentimes it's more efficient to do discriminative learning. The problem of course, is, as I said, you know, when you do discriminative learning, you have no theory of the input um, because you don't understand the way the input pixels are varying with respect to each other to generate interesting pictures of cats and dogs, et cetera, et cetera. So interestingly, so this is basically like saying, uh, there may be a grader who takes an English essay and gives it a grade, but at the same grader, if you ask it, can you write me an A plus English essay? It may not be able to write the A plus English essay. It only knows how to grade a given essay. And that's the difference between discriminative and generative learners. And the reason I wanted to bring this up in today's class really is, remember this picture that we went through in the beginning of uh, the neural networks? And I sort of said, this is of course the perceptrons and this is the multi-layer. There's a bunch of other stuff that I did not look at such as bidirectional connections. And so one of the things there is these are basically multi-layer as well as single layer. They're called feed forward networks. That means the activation goes from the inputs to the outputs, that's it, okay? And it's not that if you change the output, you can't change the inputs. This is why normal neural networks, if you, change the input pixels, it will be able to change the label. If you change the label on the front, it doesn't suddenly, you know, um, materialize a cat out of thin air in the input layer. That's why it is a discriminative learner. In the recurrent networks, and basically in as, what are called associative memories, um, basically those are the neural network equivalents of generative learners. And they essentially can, given any piece of the data, they can complete the rest of the data. If you give X, they'll give you Y. If you give Y, they'll give you X. If you give part of X, they will give the rest of X and also the Y. So that's basically what associative learners are supposed to do. And doing this kind of generative models, you haven't yet seen it, except as I mentioned in today's class, the language, large language models are essentially kind of generative models because they are trying to learn the likelihood of a sentence in a given big, large corpora, like for example, web scale, web scale English language. Uh, what is the likelihood um, that this sentence is going to be generated by the same probability distribution that generated the text on the web? Um, and if you can learn that probability distribution, then in essence, you have learned the language model, okay? And so because you can use that distribution to then sample from the distribution, you will get the next word sample again, you'll get the next word sample again, you'll get the next word. So in essence, all of a sudden you're starting to write big sentences and essays. This is basically what things like GPT-3 do. Before GPT-3, that the big difference between large versus just normal language models is the kind of assumptions that language models make in terms of the kinds of dependencies that words can have on each other. Um, and so in some sense, it's again, the kind of function they are learning, the capacity of the function the language model is learning to capture the distribution, distribution of the sentences in this language. 
Um, so the simplest, very simple language models are things like one gram model, where they assume that sentences are made by independently sampling words from a big bag of vocabulary um, with differing probabilities. Some sentence, some words are, you know, uh, more often than other words, but it's context insensitive. The next word is going to be picked without looking at what words you have picked up until now. And then similarly, the two gram uh, would basically consider multiple, the two, the, the previous um, one word in deciding the next word. And n grams are essentially, you know, taking the last n minus one words to give you the next nth word. And when you're learning um, n gram language models, essentially, you will wind up having a more complex probability distribution about how words, uh, the probability of picking a word depends on the context of the n minus one words where this, uh, this word is being picked. Uh, and typically all these language models in this n gram, basically n is the window size. They're sort of taking the large uh, piece of the, let's say 256 words at a time, and then looking at the given previous 256 words, they're computing, they're basically trying to guess the next word. Um, when you do this, in a sense, you have a generative model. You're trying to generate sentences that you think are approximately like the sentences that are in the Carpora that you have seen. Again, the fancy word I'm saying is Carpora. Um, and basically that comes from Carpus. Carpus is like a, a body of in this particular case, you know, examples, so sentences on the web. And as I said, the way the large language models are typically learned is in this autoregressive fashion. Um, and uh, that basically means you take, uh, you know, take the training data, um, which is basically just raw sentences on the web, and then take uh, K words and try to predict the K plus one word. And then when you are able to predict the K plus one one word, Correctly, there's no problem because that means the function you currently have is already good for that example. If not, you have to construct the error between the word you predicted and the word that actually is there and you use that to essentially back propagate that error. Okay, in particular, most language models actually, and I should probably change the color so that you will know which ones I'm writing now. Most language models, um, LLMs, output word distribution rather than a single word. That means given K words, um, they will output a distribution for the K plus one word. And this distribution is compared to the actual word, which will essentially be a one heart distribution. That means it basically puts all the probability mass in the word that's actually present in this sentence in the training data. And the distances between these two distributions are used using this logistic error to essentially train the network. Okay, so the old logistic error that we were talking about before comes back again here. Okay, um, so then the question, the other question is, of course, where is the data? The data is all the data text in the web, as I mentioned, and uh, you don't need any labels because the data is what the data is, and you're just trying to complete the data. You're taking a sentence of, you know, maybe larger than, you know, K words, and then you're looking at any K words and predicting the next word, and then taking another next, uh, that those words and predicting the next word and so on. Um, and basically, that's what you are trying to do in learning these language models, the training phase. And the, the name here is because you're not asking for any labels for the data, they call this self-supervised or you know, original statistics people used to call it auto-regressive, uh, okay? Auto-regressive. Um, okay, um, so again, um, this is that, that, okay. So the other thing that I also, also mentioned in the class, again, I'm going over this somewhat slowly again, uh, before going to the new stuff, that one big difference between language data and the image data are actually the two differences. One is language is sequential. And also language is pixels versus words. That's the other difference. Okay, um, 
this slide, we basically looked at how to handle the sequential information. I, as I said, actually, you can ignore the sequential information and assume that a sentence is really just a bag of words. No, not surprisingly, uh, one gram language models are essentially assuming that words are picked from a bag of vocabulary. So they will essentially think of a sentence as a bag of words. Right, that's the interesting part. Um, whereas more complex ones essentially kind of take interword dependencies into consideration. You could take the sequence information very seriously, and that will get you to what are called recurrent neural networks. And you know that's where these things like LSTM and GRU ideas come. I would not discuss this. I'm just going to name drop here to say that those actually take the sequence information completely seriously. The problem, of course, taking sequence information seriously is that you would have to process the text in sort of a sequential fashion while during the learning. Um, and the whole point is that our hammer right now is GPUs, which will do massive parallel processing. So if you can look at a big window of a uh, big window of uh, uh, words and then basically parallelly processing them as again as sequentially, you will be better off. So the question then is, how can you do that? One idea is to play fast and loose with the sequence information. Um, and then basically, as I said, you can act as if you're going to add positional tags to the words and then put them in the bag. Uh, so there is an elephant in the first position, an elephant in the 14th position, et cetera. That's the general idea, except how this positional tag is added to the words is going to be explained in the next slide where you actually convert the words themselves into real valued vectors, okay? So which is basically something that I was again looking at in the class. So you convert the words themselves into, uh, you know, basically you have to convert them into real numbers. The simplest idea is make, if the vocabulary is of size V, then you essentially make a vector of, you know, size V and then basically put zeros everywhere except at the point where that word is there. So for example, if there's word one, et cetera, up to word V, then essentially, if you're talking about ith word, then it will have a, it will have a, 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 a vector which has zero, zero, zero in the ith position, a one, zero, zero, zero. And this is overall length V, okay? So if you have that, then essentially um, you will essentially basically, this is sort of, all the words are like one hard encodings. A better idea it turns out, which basically makes words themselves have, obviously words are have meanings. And so certain words essentially are closer to certain other words in them being synonyms. And whether or not they're synonyms, is essentially while dictionary basically might define what are synonyms of what, you can actually understand that a word is a synonym of another word if that word winds up being used in the context of the same other word. So for example, if you know word 15 is being used in the context of a sentence from words 1 to 14 and word 16 to 17. And in the same context, another word 20 was used. That means words 15 and 20 are sort of functional synonyms. Okay. Um, and so this information um, essentially has to be captured in the word representation. And an idea there is reduce the dimensionality of these vectors. Now, the interesting question, this is something that I did not do. As I said, in GPT-3, uh, while the vocabulary side might be millions of words, they essentially went with some 12K dimensional vector for each word. Each word basically becomes a 12,000 dimensional vector. Um, so instead of being a vector in a million uh, or multi, multi million dimensional space, it becomes a vector in only a 12,000 dimensional space. Now the question is who gives these 12,000 dimensional space? So for each word, there should be these kinds of vectors. The advantage of doing this essentially is that if you can reduce the dimensionality, the close by words are likely to possibly go closer to each other in this new lower dimensional space while they probably 
were not connected to at all each other because they're all in two different dimensions. You know, um, each vector, each word was in a different dimension in the one heart vector uh, representation. So that, first of all, to do this, this is something that I did not teach in the class. I'm going to say it now. It turns out that actually you can do this, interestingly enough, using the same feed forward network technology. What do we do? You essentially, and in fact, you know, I'm going to show this picture in a bigger form. Um, what basically, what we're trying to do is we're trying to take, uh, you know, let's say a six dimensional vector and you're trying to somehow convert into a three dimensional vector, like, you know, a million dimensional vector and convert into a 12,000 uh, dimensional vector. If you do this in essence, you're sort of clustering words, you're sort of finding regularities in their functional usage, et cetera. Um, the way to do this in essence, basically is it turns out that you can use this idea called autoencoders where you will convert the words you know, the, the higher dimension thing into a latent lower dimension. This is the latent um, vector of the lower dimensionality. Um, and then presumably you should convert it back to the, convert it back to the same original dimensional vector. And when you do this, these two vectors, the original vector and the reconstructed vector should be as close to each other as possible, okay? If you do this in essence, I mean, I'm just giving you a very quick overview, but if you can do this essentially, and notice that training this network essentially will still be feed forward because there is no background. Basically the activations are going from input to this latent dimensions to the output. And the error is being computed in terms of being able to predict the word that was input when you get the new word. Okay, and this error is then propagated back, and in doing so, you will wind up getting the um, you will be end up getting the latent dimensions. This is a very smart idea. This is called uh, autoencoders, and so feed part of feed forward neural networks themselves can be used for dimensionality reduction. A particular way of doing that is well known: word vectors um, that basically more or less people have focused on. Uh, I think there's this, you know, whole paper by Mikolo and Co, which sort of gave, let's say, a, a kind of a, a way of computing these lower dimensional vectors for the English words. And then the number of lower dimensions you can choose. And in the case of obviously uh, GPT-3, they have wound up choosing, choosing uh, like a 12,000 dimensional uh, latent vector. Okay, so if you do this, then you essentially have a smaller vector. And the other trick is when you have this smaller vector, you know, for each word, then instead of it being a one heart vector, it will actually be, you know, one heart vector in let's say vocabulary sized vector. Um, you now you're going to have this, whatever 12,000 dimensions or whatever your latent dimensionality of the vector that you picked is, okay. Um, one of the interesting things there is then essentially, as I said, that these vectors are likely to capture the interword relations. And so these are the kinds of pictures you wind up seeing when you're looking at um, uh, word vector representations on the web. So this one essentially is taking this lower dimensional vector and again, taking a projection of it in like two dimensions of this lower dimensional vector. And in that lower dimensional space, they'll, for example, notice that like words like brother, nephew are essentially coming closer to each other. And, um, and all sorts of funny things will basically, there's some things like, you know, if you have king and queen um, vectors, they will have the same sort of vector relation as man and woman vectors in this space. Again, these things are not guaranteed to work, but they sort of work out. Basically, the reason we are doing this is mostly to mostly to uh, get these smaller real valued vectors. And then one other thing is this position encoding. Remember in the previous slide, we were talking about how to include positional encoding and still look at it as a bag. One idea would be to take these vectors, these lower dimensional vectors 
and add them some sort of a positional vector information. There are ways of doing it. I won't go into it right now, but they wind up adding a little additional. So basically this becomes a vector addition. The original vector is actually the meaning of the word. The new vector is of the same dimension, but they start up trying to capture the position by being different in different positions, okay? And when you add them up, you get this new word, a new vector, and you're hoping that this vector captures both the word information and the mean and the positional information. There's no guarantees, there's no theory as to why this should make sense, but it seems to sort of kind of work, and this is what has been called the positional encoding trick. If you use positional encoding trick, then in a sense, you will be able to do parallel processing of these words all at once. And when you can do that, um, again, we went through this, when we can do that, then the idea of transformers can really be seen as doing an approximately some sort of a 1D convolutions, uh, even though not exactly, but 1D convolutions over the sequence data where the sequence is a sequence of words, word one, et cetera, word K, all of them are represented as word vectors, word vectors plus position information. Okay, so position information then reach word vectors. And then you have this basically the, you know, just like a convolution thing, you now have a 1D kernel. Okay, and you basically can shift this kernel over the over the sequence essentially and uh, and this is basically what you're doing instead of convolutions you are doing um you know convolutions on the image you're doing 1d convolutions on the sequence um on the sequence and if you do this yeah, as far as i can see essentially you're doing the same idea all the discussion that we did about the convolutions would work here too except the terminology used in describing transformers is everything like attention as if which words are you giving more importance to when trying to make sense of a particular word in you know um how are you trying to get basically give the weights to the other words in the um, sequence. Well, I would say that in a picture too, I could say that when you have a convolutional kernel, then this kernel essentially is saying that for this pixel, the weights in this kernel are going to tell you how much each of those nearby pixels are going to be weighted in trying to compute the dot product at that point, for example. Okay, so really the transformers are probably best understood, at least for you guys, as sort of one day convnets. And uh, to get there, you had to first get word vectors, which actually winds up being a sort of a, a sort of a um, clustering idea. It's basically, you, you know, kind of auto encoder kind of an idea, um, which is basically dimensionality reduction idea. And then, then there is this trick, this nonsensical trick called positional encoding trick, which sort of adds a little bit to all these vectors. And that little bit is connected to the position of the word in the sentence. Um, and it's almost like, as I said, the mental picture is the elephant word has like a tag written. This is the elephant occurring in the first position. This is the elephant occurring in the ninth position, except I'm in doing that, the tag and the elephant, the word are different here you're combining both of them in some unholy mix, essentially. And that is, there's nearly no reason why it should work, but people basically are finding that it sort of does a reasonable job in predicting the next word and giving plausible completions. This is basically the closest we get to in understanding how GPT-3, the thing that we looked at in the very beginning of the class, how it works. Okay. So as I said, I think, you know, a long time back, I kind of threw this in the tweets that, so really instead of saying attention and multiple attention word heads, which is what transformer literature talks about, things in terms of filter and filter banks, there's basically the same idea. Attention is all you don't need, even though the original transformer papers is titled, attention is all you need. In fact, attention is not, is not, is kind of confusing things. It brings in mostly incorrect cognitive associations is what is basically a indefinite sized filter 
um, with positional information thrown in. And the other part is essentially, as I said, think of it in terms of just you know doing the completion of the words. And, um, and then the third, as I said here, it's best to think of transformers as falling between RN on one side, which takes sequence information very seriously, and bag of words on the other side, which completely ignores it. You know, transformers kind of do some kind of hand waving by taking some position information into account. And so that sort of helps little more than you know just the simple bag of words but as i said bag of words is no no fool right basically bag of words was what was used by google for the longest time you know um in in doing its search results and uh, bag of words is used in information retrieval literature all the time okay um so anyway that's the one day next business um, the other thing that I wanted to mention that I didn't have time for in the class, but I since I have the slides, I'll just show you so that you will have heard the uh, path that we already talked about, we already talked about one generative model, language models are already uh, generative. The other one, the, even the auto encoders can essentially be thought of as generative because they're essentially learning the distribution um, you know, effectively because they're predicting X from X by first reducing its dimensionality to a lower dimensional space. And one very interesting thing is while it is true and that every real word in, you know, basically winds up having a different one heart encoding, let's say, um, they basically, you, if you are in this latent dimension, they are dense vectors. They are not one heart vectors at all. They will have all dimensions will have non-zero numbers. And so if you just find any other uh, vector in this space, essentially, if you just randomly pick a vector in this space, that sort of kind of corresponds to a word that should have existed in the language, even though it may not actually exist. You know, there are things in English language for which we don't have words when we get by anyway. For example, there is very famous point that English language doesn't actually have in many languages, I think, including English language, doesn't have a word for this thing, this cleft that we have on our lips. There's no actual word for it. We just all of them are all of us have it, but we don't have a word for it. Okay. So there can be more words than there are in the English language to look at, describe the patterns that we see the world. Uh, and when you convert one heart encodings into this latent layer, in essence, you can develop new words by picking a new latent vector and seeing what it gets transformed to in this, the, this you know, one heart representation. It won't necessarily be a one heart representation, but this is the base representation. An interesting point is instead of thinking in terms of these being one heart vectors, instead of thinking of these as being one heart vectors, suppose um, you thought of these in stuff, in stuff, one heart vectors, you thought of these as image pixels. That means the X1 to X6 are a six dimensional image pixels. And then I'm making a lower dimensional vector for the, that image. And then I'm reconstructing the image back. When you do this, in essence, you are essentially computing a compression for the images. And the interesting thing is that when you actually pick a, a new um, latent vector in the latent space and you translate it, it corresponds to some new image that may not have been seen before. Do, do you see what I'm saying? So for all the images that you have seen, there will be latent vectors, but the images that, but there are latent vectors for which you haven't yet seen images, but this network will still transform these latent vectors into images. And that would be like freshly newly generated images. This would be a generative model in essence of images. And this is the sort of idea ultimately in you know, kind of generating new images. And in fact, a version of autoencoders called variational autoencoders have actually been used to develop new images after being trained on some number of images, freshly new images. They were okay, it's just that 
basically the idea is fine. It's just that it didn't work as well in practice. And the thing that worked better in practice is actually instead of looking at, in, at it in terms of this autoencoder, right, where you view this as a game between a generator network, which takes you know, a noisy input and generates an image, okay? And a discriminator, which has access to a whole bunch of data, naturally occurring data, and it looks at this generated sample and says whether or not this generated sample is like the data it has seen or is it a made up data? Okay, so the idea is, for example, if this is pictures of all cats, okay, and this generator generates some picture which kind of looks like this, then the discriminator will say, well, this picture doesn't look like any other cat pictures. So this is not from the data distribution. And so then generator basically loses, discriminator wins. Discriminator is trying to catch generator um, when it is trying to generate images of the kind it actually seen. That means they actually naturally exist, okay? So this is essentially the idea. And then what you do is over a period of training, essentially the generator um, is trying to generate more, uh, um, the, the error for generator is in our discriminator catches it, uh, that is the error that is propagated into generator. And whenever discriminator fails to catch a fake, that is the error that is propagated into the discriminator. And in essence, it's again the same back propagation, except it's actually from theoretically, it turns out this error surface is a more interesting kind of a surface. It's actually a saddle point. It is a question of finding a saddle point rather than finding a max or a minima. That's too much theory right now, but that's basically what GANs do. And again, interestingly, if you consider either autoencoders or GANs, they are able to do generative models without doing associative memories, okay? So these things like Hopfield networks and um, they are called Hopfield networks and Boltzmann machines. And these are the kinds of networks where the activations go both ways. So the inputs affect outputs, output affects inputs. In the case of feed forward networks, only the input affects output. If you change the output, inputs don't change. What actually happens if you were to change the input? I said sometimes that you can learn adversarial examples um, you know, by changing the input, but there it's not the network that is doing it, but it's this back propagation that is doing it in generating the adversarial examples. So the cute thing about autoencoders as well as generative adversarial networks, GANs, is you're getting by with essentially multi-layer or feed-forward networks, while still getting something like a generative or associative memory models, okay? So that's what GANs do. And, you know, I mean, I think you've seen, you know, GANs in action. If you go to, is this person real? Um, .com or something, which is many of these sites exist, where they will generate pairs of pictures at a time and you're supposed to spot which one is actually a real picture, which one is a picture that never was there in the training data. That means there is no human of that particular face. It's just that they look human. You think they could have been a human, even though it's not in anywhere in the training data. And when you do this, essentially you're generating GANs and we're generating you know, fake pictures. And the interesting thing is, remember when I was doing this discussion with respect to the autoencoders, that if I pick, if I pick a new latent um, a vector, it does correspond to a new kind of a word in the original dimensions. It's just that since we only have names for, we only have names for one heart encoding vectors in this space, we didn't know what this word is because this has non-zero numbers in more than one dimension. Um, whereas if it was pixel, pixels, then it's just, you know, basically both in this dimension and the latent dimension, essentially they can be dense vectors. 
And so what happens is that for every latent dimension that you feed in, essentially you will be able to generate some new picture. And that may not have been a picture that was in the training data to begin with. And so that's how actually essentially auto encoders also generate new pictures. It's just that, you know, as uh, the as uh, um, original papers uh, like by um, in Goodfellow, Ian Goodfellow, et cetera, say, at that time, at any rate, you know, auto encoders were giving these newly generated pictures that tended to be more hazy, whereas now with the GANs, you can generate pretty high definition pictures. And then this sort of leads me to the very last thing I want to say today, which is again, one more of my students work here, um, Neharika, um, Alberto, uh, and Shailik. Essentially, one thing is that GANs have been used for data augmentation. So the idea is that if you basically GANs are, I mean, auto encoders are GANs are basically learning the data density, the learning the data distribution. So if you learn the distribution, you can sample um, from that distribution. And basically this is what it means by throwing a noise here. You sample from the distribution by throwing the noise into the generator and the generator will generate a new uh, picture. Um, so the interesting question is if you only have like, uh, if you need more names of you know, more faces than you have, for example, you can go to this, uh, which face is real and generate more and more pictures. In fact, there are you know companies now which generate lots and lots of realistic looking faces that don't belong to any actual person that you know of, but they basically look like people's faces. The interesting thing there is that while we may not have seen every human in the world, we do seem to have learned some distributional information such that if I show you a new picture, you can tell whether it's a human face or not human face. So you do realize that human faces, which are these high dimensional vectors, not every vector in that space is a human space, right? Because not every 4096 by 4096 pixel configuration is a human face. Some of them are cats, some of, most of them are white noise really. Right, but the human faces live in like some small part of the space, some high dimensional manifold in this space. And so the question essentially is this distribution is figuring out what that manifold is and it's able to sample from other parts in this manifold. To the extent you can learn the distribution, you can essentially um, generate more data than you started with. It looks like a great idea. And in fact, many people commercially actually use GANs to generate more data this way. The problem of course is GANs don't really learn P of X. They kind of try to approximately learn P of X. And this can lead to problems. If the data that you have seen is not representative enough, then there can be more um, problems because the, the distribution you learn um, may also have, might actually generate data that's not what would have been there in the real world. So an example in this case is Niharika and Alberto and Shailik essentially took pictures of faces of, um, faces of engineering faculty and they essentially trained again using that. So it will generate engineering faculty. And then when you ask it to generate new engineering faculty faces, what it will do is it will generate these kinds of ones. We were not, they were not using a particularly high capacity GAN. So they look like augers, you know, sort of monsters, but they all look male white augers. Okay. Um, and so that sort of captures the fact that when you, um, you know, augment the data in essence, if the original data was, uh, you know, engineering processes are mostly male and white, then the new data is also likely to have that. Uh, and more importantly, the bigger problem essentially is that uh, essentially that with the GAN, there is this idea called GAN collapse, which is basically GANs, you know, don't learn the full distribution. They'll essentially try to learn just the most likely um, images and they'll generate more and more copies of them. 
Um, if that happens, then you will say GAN has collapsed. And when that happens, essentially any disparity, any imbalance in the original data can be exacerbated. You know, biases can be exacerbated. Okay, so this is something that you know these guys Nehari Kalbato Shailik have shown, um, and so you have to keep that in 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 mind. Um, by the way, the the way GANs work essentially, obviously, again depends on the training data on which they are being trained, which is exactly why, in fact, this paper also shows the connections to Snapchat selfie lens which basically can be used to improve quote unquote your pictures and most of the way it apparently was improving it is by making people look more whiter and more caucasian because in essence that will correspond to the majority of the pictures that the probably the underlying gan was trained on okay so that is uh, again, again that's basically kind of a societal impact of using uh, GANs. Um, so anyway, that's what I wanted to end with. Um, you know, obviously, I just needed one extra hour or so to go through these slowly. I'm going to put this up again. Remind you that fully connected networks are enough, um, but they're slower to train. And you will start making these assumptions about regularity in the data, like you know, as convolutional nets do, which is like the spatial locality, and the one d convolutional nets do sequence locality. Um, and then there's also a difference between uh, this, you know, discriminative learning and generative learning. And normally, uh, feed-forward networks are discriminative learners, but you can stack them in interesting ways to make them approximate generative learners, such as autoencoders and GANs, okay? I will, and also, as I said, transformers, which is like this very well-known technology that everybody talks about right now, can be understood with respect to what you have talked about in the course until today um, in terms of sort of 1D convolutional nets. They're not exactly that, but that's the closest way to understand, okay? I will stop here, thank you.